11th hour, you know, stand up with him to the very end, you know. And he came into the studio probably about uh, eight or ten days into the process and said, I'm not having fun, you know. It started then, you know, I mean, it started within the first week or so. Uh -huh. you know? He said, I'm not having fun. He was used to having fun with his records, and fun to Andy meant that everybody would just do whatever <laughs> he said, you know. <laughs> You know, he would just, anything would pop into his head, and then everyone would just perform it, you know, and essentially it would be Andy's musical playpen. And that was what was wrong with their records, essentially, was that they had no coherence. It was Andy's musical playpen. Sir, so you went in yeah. with ideas saying, what you guys have been doing all wrong so far is this. You had ideas for them, because you were more familiar with the catalog. Well, there was a mandate from the record company, which oh, really? was which was that if they didn't have some success with this album, they weren't going to have any more albums. It was it was the last indulgence from the record company. That was why the record company the record company presented them with a list of producers, and I was one of them. And they said, pick on this, pick from this list because these people are going to produce the record. You know, it's not going to. The last few records that they had done were uh, were mostly just engineers. You know, Hugh Patton and people like that. It, they would just get somebody who was an engineer cum producer and essentially give orders to them, you know, things like that. And subsequently, they, the uh, success of the records was like this, you know, and they would have records that would achieve some critical acclaim, you know, but, but, no, uh, but no commercial success. So the mandate from the record company was, you know, um, put together something worthwhile or, you know, go elsewhere. And uh, it seemed unlikely that anybody was going to sign a, ba a failing band at that point. So I didn't want the band to stop making records. And I determined up front, you know, not really not knowing, you know, that there would be much conflict, you know, but I determined up front, you know, that the band was going to make a record that people were going to like. You know, that people would have to like the record. And, and this was at odds with Andy's playpen theory, you know, and that's, I think, the, the basis of the, you know, the problems that we had. Andy had no perspective about the record. Andy probably didn't even like the record when it was finished. And, uh, and my whole theory was, the record, that was that they had already proved how clever and smart they w were, you know, and that it was time to stop um, waving it in people's face all the time, you know, and that should, they should take more of the attitude that they, uh, of seducing the listener rather than poking them in the ear, you know, at every opportunity. And, and so I had a very, I, I was very strict about it the whole time. I said, I said, this does not make musical sense, you know, or this will not help the record as a whole, you know, this will make... You know, I described it all to Andy in great length beforehand, you know. I mean, we discussed it, what was supposed to happen. I just don't think that Andy expected that I would ever go as far as I did in trying to make it happen. Um, I had it. They sent me songs. They just sent me piles of songs. And within about two weeks of receiving all their songs, I had already evolved the entire album concept almost as the album came out, you know, almost exactly as the album appeared. And, uh, and told it to Andy, gave him the whole running list of songs, which was almost exactly the way it appeared on the record when it finally came out. And, uh, and stuck to that in the end because nobody else had another suggestion about how it should go. And, and actually they did things that they had never done before. We got to the mixing phase and after two songs they said, we're going to go home because we don't think we're helping, you know. And under normal circumstances, they would have stood there through the whole mix, you know. And, you know, my attitude was that they were just, they couldn't see the forest for the trees and they should go home, you know. And subsequently, the, uh, you know, we did some, rem they listened to it. I did some remixes alone, like remix four or five songs, you know. One song they said remix, I said, I don't think I can do it better, so I won't, you know. And the album eventually came out that way. And I think their attitude, once the album came out, you know, was very, like this, came out in England first, did nothing there, like most of the rest of their records, and that was, I think, what set Andy off, you know, looking for somebody to blame, and I was the most obvious person, so. And I don't mind taking the blame, because the album <laughs> was the mo their most successful album in the United States, so. Is that right? Yeah. And it, you know, it made the, made the uh, Village Voice uh, critics poll, you know, as one of the top 40 albums of the year. And uh, Dear God became a giant hit. And it w Dear God was the, the song that Andy removed from the album. <laughs> Personally removed the song from the album. And, uh, and that must have made it even more frustrating and annoying for him, you know, that he had no perception of what was, um, you know, of, of what people wanted to hear from them, you know. Um, he insisted on putting this record on, this one song on the album that I 
in the end couldn't force them to leave off, but I thought was that? it was called another satellite, you know. Uh, oh, right, right. And, uh, and I told them that, first of all, I didn't think it belonged on the album, and second of all, it didn't represent the band because it wasn't the band, it was Andy only. You know, it was Andy at his most Andy. And the process of making the song, you know, we made the song and I kind of bowed out. It was one of the only songs where I did, wasn't involved in it because I knew he wasn't going to change the concept. And also because I said, Andy, you're just standing here telling everybody what to do. It's as if it's your solo album and we're just here, you know, like musicians. In fact, nobody even played anything on the song except an occasional, you know, one thing that might have been beyond Andy's technique, you know. Maybe some little, you know, something like that were the only things that anybody even p performed on the song. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, so. uh, how's your track record uh, as of late as a producer? Well, I've cut back a lot on my on the on my records. Mm -hmm. uh, as as much as Andy complains about Skylarking, that probably did gave the greatest boost to my producing career of any album I've worked on, right. because everyone that heard it was so heavily affected by it that they wanted me to produce their record. Is that you know? right? Um, Yes, well, it's obviously a difficult concept to pull off, you know, not something that, that every producer would be willing to do in the first place. And that was part of it. I think the sound of it was exceptional in a certain way, and that was part of it. And also because it was an obvious progression for the band. And, uh, and most bands, when they actively look for a producer, are, are looking for someone to bring something else to the process, you know. And since it was obvious that I had brought uh, some new coherence or whatever to what they were doing, you know, that other people wanted that. In particular, the next project that I did, Bourgeois Tag, they, you know, that was the specific thing that caused them to do that. And everyone who's come to me lately asking me to do a record for them has mentioned Skylarking. So. Right. Mm -hmm. Have you had to, like, turn down some... A lot of people there? I have to turn down most everybody Is who comes right? to me. Yeah, you know. I get production offers maybe, I would say at least a half a dozen to ten production offers a month. Oh God, In the course of a year, I might be offered 50 acts to produce. Some of them, I'll, the greater portion of them are first time, and then some of them are people that it uh, doesn't make any sense for me to do, and then some of them are things that also, as a natural course, don't ever don't ever work out because of scheduling or because uh, or because you're one of four or five producers that they ask, you know, or something like that. It's a very well-paying labor of love. It's well-paying, yeah, but it's also time-consuming, and I took. Um, Right before Skylarking, I had been involved in a couple of records that I didn't care about and realized I didn't want to do that anymore. You know, that I had done a couple of records mostly for the money. Mm -hmm. And I realized, you know, regardless of whatever financial hardship I found myself under, I was never going to produce records just for the money. I was going to produce records that I thought were going to be important or significant in some way, you know. And so I only got involved in records that I thought were, you know, were that way. Mm -hmm. I, I mentioned Love Bomb because that didn't seem to be one of the more successful. Yeah, well, that came before that. Was oh, that right? Yeah, that came before Skylarking. But also, um, I uh, produce Tubes records because they're personal friends of mine. I you know, I, will, I can always be induced to do a record for a personal friend mm. if, you know, if uh, all other things being equal. So. Mm. Mm. <coughs> yeah. Okay, I guess we'll get a few more. Um, okay, let me just see if I got everything. They sent me this facsimile here before I can read ah, mm -hmm. Let me see if I covered the questions. I've got about two minutes to go here, so. Uh, alrighty. I think we got what we need. Are there any acts that we should uh, be on the lookout for that uh, you have big hopes for? Acts on the lookout for? Let me see now. I don't get an opportunity to see, you know, people much. Uh, before other people have discovered them, mm -hmm. you know, it's not. I'm not. I don't really occupy a unique uh, position in music that I get to hear, you know, everything first. But no, uh, like those who've already been discovered and, and, and uh, marketed. Uh huh. Oh, let me see now. Well, I, I, uh, I think we made a lot of progress with the last Bourgeois Tag album, and um, based on that, if they take to heart everything that they've learned and everything that's been accomplished with it that I, th I think they have great potential as songwriters, but they have yet to really um, um, to me it's the apotheosis of songwriting is the same thing as as uh, 
as um, 